away from Cameroon to be with us. Uh, yes, warm applause for that. He's an avant-garde filmmaker, he's a producer, he is a philosopher, I would say, on African cinema, but also the question of what cinema is in general has been uh, a thread through his work, I would say. Uh, he is a former member of the FESPASI, the F Federation of African uh, Cinema, uh, Fe Federation of African Cinema, Cineast, uh, <laughs> um, and also he created the Alliance of World, C the Alliance of World Cinema in Berlin. He is a founding member of that. He also did an exhibition at Savi Contemporary in 2016, which was called "Welcome to Applied Fiction," where he was uh, probing this moment where the magic happens, where the the fiction of the screen enters the physical space and how the, the, uh, the relation between the maker and the spectator unfolds. And uh, we're really happy that he's here today to uh, share with us his thoughts on the question of the making of healing cinema. And uh, yeah, I would like to welcome Jean-Pierre on stage. Hello. to write whatever because I, I thought it would be a very formal kind of space and what happened this morning really completely changed my, <laughs> my approach. So maybe we'll have to breathe. <laughs> so, um, so I just want to say that the whole concept of uh, the healing, uh, we started it, I started it before Corona, so it's nothing to do with Corona, but kind of uh, Corona helped uh, because the idea of healing times, living in healing times, uh, are kind of opposite to the vaccination times. <laughs> so is healing a vaccination so that you just get a shot and then you're done? But it also has to do with maybe the, the sick times, you know, uh, what make us sick or what are we sick of somehow. And um, as you all know, during the corona time, we were all doing some Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and to be very honest, me, when I was doing Zoom, I was really shocked by the, 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 the ugly faces. <laughs> because aesthetically, you know, Zoom doesn't show the best side of you. And I was like, but we have all these distribution problems. We are having... Um, we are discussing how the, the venues to show the films, the platforms, and we, here is a platform, and we just show our faces, you know. Um, uh, and also, just talking with an image was very funny, you know. Uh, as a filmmaker, why do we talk showing our face? Uh, if we just show the face, we talk fine, but showing my face, I felt like no, I should show a film. So maybe we need to find a way to zoom with the kind of all the knowledge we've developed in filmmaking with images so that at least the language we use is not just a verbal language, but with our ugly face. So, um, so that was one of the things I, um, I, okay, the, I was thinking, okay, um, uh, we're we, we, we having a lot of problems, questions, things to we try to solve, but we don't really take on to action to kind of change something about it. So for me, that was really important. And another thing also that for me was crucial during Corona time, uh, uh, watching American films, I didn't believe that a virus can just shut the world off. Because Americans will always be there to save us, you know, like <laughs> Will Smith, you know. I mean, cinema, like the way we kind of, we've been seeing it, you know, American cinema, even if we know it's cinema, but I didn't think American will die of virus, virus. You know, I was like, why don't they come up with a solution? It's the like Americans, you know? So we kind of discover how cinema has been lying to us, you know, really. For me, uh, uh, I couldn't accept the idea that, you know, and you had all these numbers, you know, today 10,000 people died, and, and it was like, 
we believe that we live in a specific world, but then now this reality check for me was uh, really something that um, uh, showed what kind of cinema was doing to us, you know, somehow making us powerless, like, like make us believe that we have a kind of, we can do something uh, with all these actions and all this stuff. But then when the real thing comes, we really kind of, we are lost. So that for me was also um, a big shock. Actually, my name is Jean-Pierre Bicolo. I'm from Cameroon. <laughs> um, I'm a filmmaker. I mean, I think I was very well introduced by Loa. Um, and obviously, uh, uh, I'm t talking to you from a Cameroon perspective, eh, too, because I just spent like almost three years in a row after 30 years traveling and coming back and forth. But this is the time I just stopped and I was there uh, for three years and um, uh, obviously uh, so, uh, how can I say it um, uh, forgive me if I have that perspective still in <laughs> on the world so uh, the, uh, the, this whole idea of being here for me actually um, I think it's a very important um, space uh, because um, I I uh, I've always felt alone, you know, in all these questions, you know, alternatives. How do we do things differently? How do we, as, I don't know, third world, south, whatever name they give us, how do we kind of engage with what's going on? Uh, and one of the points I really think is important is to, whatever will come out of this, but I think it's, um, uh, it's good to first know why we're doing this, what are we sharing as values? You know, maybe uh, are we not sharing as values? Um, and maybe um, uh, when we even decide to do something either with technology, we should consider that maybe that technology is loaded with ideology. You know, we don't just go on the, a platform because at the end there's a, there are shareholders between behind the business that has the platform, and so just think it's very important that uh, even the tools we are, we are going to to use are, are, are kind of loaded. So um, uh, I think the big phenomenon we've experienced lately as a uh, as film makers, film producer, film distributor, it's Netflix. Uh, I guess everybody has Netflix, who's been on Netflix, you know. Um, um, everybody's asking me, why don't you have your films on Netflix? Okay, and for me, okay, first, I don't know how you get your film to Netflix, uh, but one of the other things is that, uh, like most of my films have been sold to American universities, I can sell a copy for between three hundred dollars and one thousand uh, dollars, and there are a lot of American universities, you know. And uh, if I put my film on Netflix, then every student will watch it for ten dollars for the whole month or whatever. And obviously, I, guess, I think you know, that model won't work for me. That's that just what I, I, I could see. But sometimes also, um, uh, you know, we kind of judge our work based on the number of views and or uh, uh, theater is like the nom d'entrée and cinema. But when you are an artist, one, only one person buys your painting. Yeah? <laughs> so, but we need millions of people. And then we end up sometimes in supermarkets uh, dreaming of having our DVD sold next to some potatoes for one ninety nine, for example. So I don't know how valuing, how one can value that. You know, I don't know why we feel great that somebody just bought some chips and then bought your film. And, you know, so anyway. Um, so some people were talking when in the questions about to define the words and stuff very well, to make sure we talk about the same thing. Uh, and one of the... The, the question I always have is when you talk about cinema today, you know, uh, are we really talking about the same thing? The same way every text is not literature, I don't think every moving image is cinema. No, uh, uh, and um, uh, I, I, I like a lot the, uh, the Nigerian phenomenon of, of Nollywood. Actually, I like the no. Because the no of the Nollywood, <laughs> um, meaning there's no cinema actually. <laughs> And um, 
I remember, I don't know which year they declare that uh, Nollywood has presented, has produced 1,000 movies. And I think it was the same year where you had the Boko Haram uh, uh, woman, girl, uh, how do you call it, kidnapped. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you made 1,000 movies and one couldn't tell us that Boko Haram is coming, you know? So, I mean, not just that film is supposed to be, but just like randomly, like out of 1,000 movies made in a place and something as big as Boko Haram happened and no, not one film could tell us it's coming. So, uh, what is cinema doing in that case? Uh, actually, the French word is distraction, distraction, meaning when somebody wants to rob you, make you look left to take something right. So, so meaning that something is happening, but you definitely not seeing it, and it's a choice not seeing it now. So you're being distracted. Uh, they call it entertainment. But uh, at the same time, in the same country in Nigeria, you have somebody like Fela Kuti, and what was very interesting, we analyzed 20 Fela songs. Fela was the first to talk about African corruption, army, uh, powers, coup d'etat. He was the first to really talk about everything to come to Africa. And he was arrested, going to jail for that. Uh, so he saw the Africa coming. You know, today people talk about all these things in the UN, but they forget that when Fela was talking about it, nobody was talking about it, and he was arrested. So this is Nigeria, too, who's producing the Nollywood, you know, and at the same time, you had the Fela. So um, okay. now, what is this whole mimicking? Because that's what, you know, Nollywood is, and we're all concerned about mimicking. You know, they tell us, when you make a film, go to a festival. I didn't know festival exists, to be honest, when I really started my film. And then, ah, okay, there's a festival. Now get dressed well. Ah, okay. Now there's a red carpet. Ah, okay. So, so you kind of follow whatever has been designed for you as a filmmaker um, to do. But obviously, when you are from Cameroon, uh, and you think about why you made the film, and me personally, I think it was not for this, you know? So, um, I don't know, it's because it's a third world kind of, we have so many things. Me, I personally had a very strong desire to express myself. You know, I feel like, uh, you know, if I don't express myself, I'll die or something. So, that's really why I think I was doing this. But now, the red carpet has become, like, the reason why people make films. We even take some cases where, like, I don't want to say bad things about Ekal Noir, our festival in Yaoundé, <laughs> but they put a kind of red carpet, you know, and then the whole town, because it's shown live on TV, the whole petite bourgeoisie, make sure they will see them on TV going up the red carpet, and then they don't even stay for the movie, and then they go back home. <laughs> so the, the red carpet has become the film itself. The, the, so, and, and at the same time, it's popular. That's now the other problem, like... The, Everybody loves it. Everybody think uh, now s the great cinema is coming to us, you know, because of uh, because of this red carpet. So, um, uh, okay. Uh, okay, being from Cameroon is also very interesting. Has been very interesting. Uh, again, we kind of experienced Corona from. I experienced Corona from Cameroon. Uh, but what was very interesting was the fact that uh, we always knew that when it, there is a disease, you know, white people will find a solution and we'll be fine. You know, we never thought they would be dying from something, you know. So when we see that people are dying in America, in France, in Germany, we're like, what? So this thing is so bad that the people who always come and s with a solution are kind of lost. And what happened in Cameroon? people decide to go back to dig in their traditions. And the meaning is like, what were we doing? And they came up with a lot of solutions. People who have who had given up to African whatever, uh, herbal, and then they start finding solutions. So in Cameroon, I don't know how many solutions we have against COVID. I think we had like 10 to, and it was working, I mean, for a lot of people. But this would have never happened if the Western world were not dying. So they kind of trigger the fact that the West couldn't deal with it, you know, made us think, hey, we have some culture. You know, we can go back and look. So it's really interesting So how we are today in the way we look for solutions. 
I mean, we talk about films, we talk about solutions for distribution, for production, but obviously we're waiting for what people in Hollywood, whatever, will tell us about it. You know, no, go to Netflix, oh, go you know, to this platform. But obviously, uh, Tabo, no, Tabo Mbeki, the South African president, used to talk about the African solution, so, you know, even if uh, it was kind of a joke because he was on HIV and he, uh, he was waiting for the African solution without looking for it, in a way. So uh, this perspective of being from there and trying to, to see that maybe there are solutions about a lot of things, you know, but we kind of completely, not brainwashed, but completely distracted to just wait for a solution coming from. So in our film practice, I just think everything comes almost from uh, America mainly, and then a little bit here and there, uh, from, from Europe. So um, the last thing about Cameroon, then I'll stop talking about Cameroon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one of the things I really like about Cameroon is the social media in Cameroon. I think they are the best in the world. I, I don't think the Zuckerberg imagined what people would do with Facebook in Cameroon. To be honest, I've joined also a little bit the whole thing. <laughs> so I'm publishing some articles in, uh, in the social media. But, um, okay. I, 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 for me, it's a very good vitrine, a good, very good uh, way to look at the world. Because as a filmmaker, you have to kind of know which world we live in, what do you want to do, what do you want to express, and is it... Um, and uh, uh, um, my big question now, uh, like if I just post my picture being in Berlin, I go into the brand boot tour, I put it on Facebook, some people will start writing the commentary, nice. Who do you think you are? Why are you trying to show off? You know, so like all this commentary, you know, I don't know people. I don't know you. Then they start saying, you know, why are you trying to show off? Why do you think you think going to Germany is what? So you have all these kind of uh, arguments or reactions just on my post. So I don't post anything, you know, <laughs> because sometimes I'm, I don't want. I post when I'm ready for reactions. <laughs> But sometimes I feel like, no, I don't want to get to engage to a certain level. But what I like with this, with the, this uh, uh, social media is also to show how sick we are. Uh, because you can't travel the world to see how sick we are. But you take a medium and then you see how, what is kind of dysfunctioning about. But I really think, and when I look at that, uh, sometimes some of this social media, I think... Um, maybe this medium, or I, I should ask a question, are, are these social media made us as human better, really, or, or worse? Uh, 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 there's an expression in Cameroon they use, they say, la terre est sale, meaning like the, the earth is dirty. So, uh, so and, and, and as a filmmaker, obviously you say, okay, should I just look at it, say, okay, it's fine, that's the way it is, or because we are kind of actors of this medium, you know, somehow, and in, extens in extension, you know, it's like, how do we kind of manage all this um, uh, uh, dirty earth? <laughs> um, so then it reached the point of your relevance. You know, I, uh, it's like, okay, I've been in Cameroon, to be honest, for these three years, last three years, I think I'm really relevant. Okay, nobody cares about, not just me, but um, I think any artistic, intellectual, film um, doesn't have any impact in the society. Uh, I don't think one can, somebody can quote one thing about Ashin Bembe, <laughs> even at the University of Yaoundé. <laughs> so I think, so when you start wondering how irrelevant we are in what we do, uh, obviously as a filmmaker with all these energies, fun, this writing, this. Uh, so you start thinking, okay, so if I, how do I exist? How do I actually, uh, there's something maybe I should change about, uh, um, uh, about what I do. Uh, and I start thinking about who's really relevant, who has been relevant for, for the last 50 years on this continent, if the intellectual, the artists are not. Uh, one of the, the things I found was that Military has been very relevant. Thomas Sankara, who's uh, president of Burkina Faso, 
I think is one of the key figure in the African transformation, contemporary Jerry Rawlings in Ghana. So these are the people who, you know, were relevant, but they had guns, you know, they were like military, you know, and obviously me, I was raised as a Christian, so killing for me, even, even killing Putin, I think I'll go to hell. <laughs> so this kind of conditioning of being completely um, uh, irrelevant, but at the same time, living in a context where we kind of put on the side these um, uh, options of the military, when you know that, like people ask in Cameroon, we had a president who's been there almost 40 years, people say, nobody's planning a coup, and you're like, hey, oh, no, you're not about this. So, so we kind of exclude that option. You know, but at the same time, obviously, you, um, uh, the, the continent was dominated with weapons. So I don't know how much intellectual I've theorized or, about weapons, <laughs> about, uh, but I guess it's coming from uh, being good Christians. So anyway, uh, it's very far from me, for me to do, difficult for me now to really think how else to be uh, 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 relevant. Now, <clears throat> If we have to talk about healing cinema, we need to kind of see, look at what makes us sick, or are we really sick or not really? So when you think about it, uh, uh, okay, we have hospitals, you know, when you have a mental problem, that's where you, you're being sent. Um, uh, and we, we, we live lives accepting all the, things that make us sick because, uh, for example, you just take the capitalistic system. You have to work, you know, for money and then, you know, pay your bills and do this thing. I think a lot of people die for doing this, <laughs> you know. Uh, there's a kind of disease behind it, you know. Some people adapt, some don't, you know. Some get cancer, some, I don't know, whatever, you know. But just the life that is kind of being uh, imposed on us is kind of... Uh, uh, kind of disease, but they, they, they obviously there are many, many levels and many types, you know, and I like also Alain Badiou, who talks about, talking about us from the South, uh, le désir de l'Occident, like, uh, we have so much desire of the West that it becomes something sick. He, he talks a lot about young uh, French uh, banlieue kids who joined the Jihad, for example, that at the same time, they, 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 they are fascinated by the West, but they hate the West also at the same time because the West maybe refused to give them something and now they fight it back. So this whole idea of, uh, and it's, it has a lot to do with consumerism, you know, when you, uh, you actually is mentioning how the dream of a lot of these kids is, is to, I don't know, to, to, to drive an SUV, to have all this expensive stuff, you know. But, uh, and, but, but we don't consider it as a disease. We consider it as just like, okay, that's how things are. Um, another case, for example, and that's one is a kind of colonial in Cameroon. We had a very funny story about um, uh, uh, an entrepreneur uh, who was selling uh, a drink that would make you light skin. Uh, and she happened to be a member of parliament. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, it was so easy to bleach, to, like just drinking, and then I'm like, we all become white, you know, so, because if, if the drink is good on the top of it, <laughs> so I think the whole, which for me was scary, when you think about it, because when you know um, uh, this South African uh, nickname, Dr. Death, you know, who kind of created this product, when you are black, you drink, you know, if you're white, you drink it, no, water, he puts something in water, uh, uh, if you're white, you drink, you don't die, if you're black, you die. And this guy, I think he's still alive, actually. He's, uh, he still has a clinic in, in Cape Town. Um, anyway, so having a product that in the, in the market, I think she did a very good market study because that product would have been very successful. So that, you know, you drink it and you become like, you know, light skin. So when we think about it, you know, this kind of disease, you know, why do people want in 2022 to become white, you know, in, in Cameroon. Uh, uh, and 
and we just take it out. It's just normal. Okay, let's just leave it the way it is. Now, there's no way we think this could be addressed. And at the same time, it's not a hardcore disease where you have to go to the emergency room. <laughs> with it. So uh, we have a lot of these kind of society dysfunctioning behavior, or and there's no place. And there's no place to go. There's no uh, solution. Uh, but uh, obviously, I believe that. Um, Cinema somehow has been able to do things to us. You know, cinema, uh, okay, we cry, we laugh. Uh, uh, I don't know if any of you have watched a kung fu movie. I don't know. When you watch a kung fu movie, when you get out, you're ready to fight. <laughs> you didn't get any training except watching the movie. So why is it? What is what is I don't know what it is really, like even myself you know like I think I'm normal you know <laughs> I go and watch a film and then you just wait for someone to <laughs> to do something to you to, for you to practice whatever you saw so it means that cinema is doing things to us you know uh, but now what is it really you know um, oh, yeah we can say yeah we, it's emotion it moves us and uh, but I think it's something more and I also believe that. There are many things that have been hidden to us. Okay, I remember uh, I was in Berlin, mm -hmm, and uh, I, I was trying to watch Nazi movies. And they say, no, 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 you cannot watch it. I'm like, come on, uh, I'm a filmmaker. So why can't I watch a Nazi film? Do you think I'm just going to kill everybody because I watched it? So, and who's pre preventing me to watch it? Like, who are you? Okay, like, I want to know. Because me, I study film. I make films. You know, so I think I'm the best person qualified, <laughs> you know, to watch this movie. So there's no way you, I don't know who you are, is it an institution? So what is your degree? What do you, what is your position to say that me, I shouldn't watch a film because it's a Nazi film? Anyway, so my idea was that if until today there's films are not supposed to watch, you're not supposed to watch, it's clear that cinema is doing something to us or can do something to us. Uh, I don't know if uh, I haven't watched. I've tried to Google some of them. I watched, I saw one or two on an uh, American uh, archive, whatever. But still, so uh, if cinema can do things to us, no. So the, 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 it's very interesting how now we can decide to um, to to do something with it. To how do we embrace that potential? You know, to solve our sickness, you know, our different sickness. Because it's not a hardcore uh, disease, like, uh, uh, because in the classic way, uh, for example, imagine that uh, somebody went to a demonstration in Paris, the Gilets Jaunes, for example, and then Macron sent, because they, 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 a lot of people lost one eye, not two, but one, during this demonstration. <laughs> So now you have all these people, you know, with one eye, you know, who had a trauma because of this demonstration. And you imagine that if they had to go through a therapy, they would go to the classic one where they start telling, asking them about their mother, their relation with, her, with their father. So it's like, but Macron is the one who sent these guys and who kind of uh, made them lose the eye. So, uh, so I think somehow we need a kind of a middle. Uh, uh, collective hospital, let's like, just put it that way. The, uh, collective hospital for collective traumas. You know, a war is a collective trauma. It's like uh, a lot of people experience it different ways, but it's still one war that, that made people sick somehow. And then you have uh, uh, political repression, you know, you have uh, um, a lot of things that are happening for groups, you know, but we don't have a place to go. And the worst thing is that when you look at, if it's cinema, uh, then you think, okay, when the cinema is in a mall, for example, so what cinema has to do in a mall? Imagine that you make a film then to heal this community that was whatever with the war involved. And then the film is being screened in a mall. I think one of my worst experiences with the mall was in South Africa, at the Durban Film Festival. Uh, we, we did a film in Fierde, which is in Bluefontaine, kind of. Uh, and then we brought people who were participating in the film to Durban to watch the film at the festival. And then when you walk in the, wall, in the mall, you have the casinos, and then the food, and then, and then it kind of kills the whole 
idea of why we do it, we're doing this, you know. And that's normal for us. You just say, okay, that's the way it is. There's nothing we can do. This one. Obviously, you, you had alternatives in the plane. <laughs> but it's like you just bought, then you put the films in the plane. So, uh, then you go to put them in a, uh, or I don't know, at home. Uh, but another thing that is also funny at home with Netflix is uh, the fact that uh, when you watch Netflix, you can start watching it at home, in the train, and at the office. So you went from a TV screen to your tablet and to your old computer. But you're not saying, I'm watching Jean-Pierre Bicolo's fame. You say, I'm watching Netflix. So we have disappeared in the middle of the process. Netflix has become what we're watching. You know? So it's completely you know, neutralizing or erasing you know, the author, somebody who actually is speaking. is Netflix now uh, who has taken over. So um, now, one of the things I really uh, like with the whole uh, uh, idea of trying something else, because for me, healing started with the idea of trying something else, we had many definitions of cinema. You know, uh, uh, I like the, the, when Godard uh, uh, says it's like a radiology. It's a picture in a, in a radiology, like x-ray or a scanner. Um, I like that, you know, being a radiologist. <laughs> I mean, uh, being a filmmaker, I meaning you just show. You know, you scan the society, you show, but it doesn't mean it has to be documentary or, uh, or the real image, but whatever it is, your job is uh, to be able to show a picture, you know. Um, and, and I also like sometimes the fact that the doctor, you know, the radiologist doesn't interpret the picture much. He sent it back to the doctor who's going to kind of, read it for you for, for to know what to do uh, so somehow I, I like that neutral position of just being a radiologist um, uh, Tarkovsky talks about the absolute reality yeah? um, I even like when he goes further and wonder why we have given up on uh, on, on immortality you know which the idea that you know that reality and can go further and maybe become or help our project, you know, uh, not to die or to kind of do something with human uh, limits, lim limitation. Uh, Christian Metz and I attended his uh, semiotic classes. Christian Metz talked about le semble réel, something that looked like real, you know. Uh, uh, so um, uh, I think all these uh, definition of cinema could be completed. You know, it's not over. You know, we can continue. Dibril Job Mambeti, for example, I did a short film on him. I like his definition of, 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 of cinema, um, where he says that it's a mother, a grandmother who tells you stories. Uh, but obviously, she tells stories um, differently. Uh, and uh, sometimes you have to speak to grandma. Like a grandma, uh, actually, the film is called Grandma's Grandma. You know, so this whole idea of keep defining cinema or trying to give it a definition and not accepting uh, the recipe. Uh, what I like about America is the how-to books. It's how-to everything, you know. Uh, how to be in Berlin, how to. <laughs> so uh, the how-to recipe, obviously, uh, uh, there's a kind of formula of what a movie is and what, uh, which actually is dangerous, is, what is dangerous that is being taught at many universities, how to, from Sid Field, who's one of the guru, I attended his class, but I didn't know what to write after that class. Uh, and then uh, Robert McKee, uh, I think the new one is John Truby, who's a kind of against the other one, but he's a new guru. So uh, the structure of a story, obviously, uh, 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 they will tell you, Aristotle said, a good story is supposed to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's kind of obvious. But the thing is, now they start building on this whole idea of writing a story. You need a climax, you need this, you know. But all this is for money. It is not to, to solve a problem, to improve anything. It's just that you will make a hit uh, uh, movie by following this recipe. Um, so uh, somehow we now are in an industry, if you can call it that way, of actually making money because the screenwriter from the beginning um, is actually in a project not to 
And there's a lot that could happen with, 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 the, the, with this script because it's people's mind, you know, you're kind of playing with somehow. Uh, Michel Serre talks a lot about um, uh, how we have abandoned the, the unknown. Like now, when you watch a movie, you say, hey, he's a killer, he's a killer, because you were told that in a way that is hidden, you think you're very smart. And one of the things with film that is also very, very important is that um, when people don't understand a film, you are the wrong filmmaker. But when people don't understand a book, they are the one <laughs> who are not smart. So they blame themselves when they can't understand a book because they think maybe I'm just an idiot. But when you know it's a movie, the filmmaker is not good. Mm -hmm. So we are actually producing films for dummies, kind of. You know, we you know if you don't manage to make your film accessible, easy, it means you're not good. Mm -hmm. So um, so all this actually. Um, uh, when you, for example, you are you have Netflix at home, you flip it. Sometimes you can flip, I don't know, 50 films, 100 films, and then you say there's nothing on TV, I go to sleep. What? Like, Netflix has like thousands of films, and you think there's nothing? Hmm? So why can you feel like there's nothing after you've flipped 1,000 movies potential in your whatever box? And if you even look at the cost of each film, Let's just take one million per film, and then it means you have one billion dollars spent, and you still feel like it's nothing, and you prefer to go to bed. Mm -hmm. So, you need to question even, obviously, what is the content, and when you know the recipes, when you know all this, it's almost like now the world is so vast, the experience is so rich, the language are so many. So, if we end up with this feeling that there's nothing, is because we're telling the same thing with the same recipe, with the same rules, kind of, you know. And even, I, I sometimes feel that uh, these medium are producing boredom because if, boredom is the, the the business. If you're not bored, you don't want to watch a film. <laughs> so it means that they produce entertainment to produce more boredom, <laughs> because otherwise, if you're not bored, there's no way you kind of feel like I'm going to watch a movie. So anyway. Uh, I, I'm thinking that we we kind of need to think about all this, you know, when we decide, okay, make a film or decide to kind of, um, uh, uh, I don't know, changing something about, you know, what we are going through. So one of the, uh, the idea of being a filmmaker, I... I thought these last years, uh, because we're relevant, because you know we have all this red carpet business, you know. But just, just wondering now, okay, how how do I change something about the filmmaking process? If you look at what we have been kind of celebrating, is the figure of the intellectual. But being in Cameroon, the intellectual is so useless. Mm -hmm. So. Being, I don't know, a Sartre, I don't know, Aron, I don't know who are the figures of the intellectual. And when you look at the context and the needs and what people are going through, you feel like, okay, being an intellectual or an artist, uh, certain way in this context is so irrelevant and so useless. So one of the figures I kind of, uh, no, uh, the, the, what I thought was really interesting is the concept I'm calling the, the therapeutical intellectual. You know, I made this film on Mudimbe. Mudimbe is talking about uh, the two kind of intellectuals, the one who's sacerdotal, intellectual sacerdotal, which is like uh, coming from the church, the priest. On Sundays, you know, the priest is doing this uh, great speech, uh, but according to a specific tradition, you know. Uh, so that's the intellectual uh, sacerdotal, you know, uh, like following a tradition. And then uh, he was talking about the... the, the, the the prophetic intellectual, you know, those just have one clear idea, they don't have to study anything, they just bring it out and it change the whole world. Karl Marx, Freud, you know, just some of them. But they are preferred dead, because when they are alive, uh, they, 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 they not, it's, not, it's not good to, that for the, the system of uh, the classic intellectual to, to exist. And so, okay, being in Cameroon, you feel that, okay, you have all this society with all these people, with all these problems, uh, actually, if you just talk about it and you go, like, what is this guy doing? So you're coming to talk. 
So the, the talk is becoming even worse than uh, irrelevant. It's just like you're almost insulting them by coming to talk. So I thought about a figure I would call the therapeutic intellectual. <laughs> you know, who's like a kind of a healer or, or somebody who doesn't talk, you know, who kind of come up and try to see what to, to do as a doctor. A doctor doesn't, cannot talk. You know, he can just whatever, and then he does whatever he has to do. And um, so this idea of a therapeutic intellectual um, uh, is also when you talk about uh, there are two types of education. You can instruct somebody, like fire them with knowledge, or you can come and construct knowledge with people together. I guess a little bit like what we did today, this morning. <laughs> so it was kind of a construction model versus an instruction model. And, uh, and the figure, I really think, who actually, uh, for two reasons, actually was close to that, is Fanon. Um, Fanon, I think, is a therapeutic intellectual. Maybe he was helped because he was a doctor <laughs> and he was a psychiatric. But he was also uh, an intellectual who saw human as sick. <laughs> it was to be treated, some people to be healed, you know, some uh, uh, the black, the Africans encounter with the white, the western world you know, made both sick mm -hmm. uh, Peau Noir, Masque Blanc is like people became sick because of this encounter you know, so now he was a psychiatrist uh, uh, um, but uh, what is interesting is that nobody's kind of decide, okay, let's heal this thing, you know? Now we need to treat, once somebody's sick, there's no alternative, you know, we need to, we need a cure. <laughs> so, but no, we're just studying Fanon, in, again, in a kind of instruction, in a sacerdotal kind of intellectual mode, while his whole project and himself engaged in Algeria, going, it was like a therapeutic, for me, intellectual, you know, between the engagement, between his doctor, or like a healer, whatever, so, and I think that figure, for me, the, I, I think as a filmmaker, I see it uh, interesting for context, also like Cameroon, where we need to kind of see how relevant, you know, uh, uh, we could be. Um, uh, and also, when we think about um, uh, today, one of the big things that I changed is that cameras are all over. You know, everybody had a camera. It was not like that before. So how do you feel being a filmmaker where everybody has a camera? You know, TikTok. Uh -huh. Like everybody can film. That was not the case, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So I think somehow we need to question ourselves as filmmakers in a world where everybody can film. And to be honest with you, one of the best kind of camera work I saw was on a sex tape. And this happened in Cameroon. I think it was uh, the, the girl who, uh, what is her name, in Ganamut. She was uh, the captain of the women team in Cameroon. She had a sex tape. And obviously, you know, we watch it because it's a sex tape, but the camera work on it was so perfect. You know, first she was filming herself, and then she was, like nothing was out of focus, out of frame, and for quite a long time, and she was in action herself. And I was like, I can hire this girl to my next movie, you know? And you wonder, as a filmmaker, if somebody, I don't know if she get any training or whatever, but can do this with a phone and a, and you start thinking, what am I doing more? Mm -hmm. What should I be able to do more? Obviously, the content was a sex tape, but still, in general, there are so many videos out there. So I came up with a concept I'm calling filmmaking without a camera. <laughs> because if the camera is all over, you know, now, let's just go without cameras ourselves, you know, uh, and uh, cinema shouldn't start when you have a camera, you know. Uh, we, we need cinema ahead before. So, um, uh, and I think maybe that's why also I'm writing a lot, uh, like on the blog, on Facebook, because I, I, I study physics, so I didn't even study literature or whatever. So I write as a filmmaker, even when I write words, you know, and that's where I start writing. I never wrote before that. So, um, uh, so filmmaking with a, without a camera is actually to kind of think about cinema, you know, uh, uh, first as a, as a, 
as we see the world. That cinema, it should be like a philosophy, a way we see the world, a way we kind of engage with the world. I guess that's what makes us all admire somebody like Godard, because he was a thinker, you know, with images. So uh, I think, for me, filmmaking without a camera will, will give a filmmaker, for me, that statue of being a filmmaker that a TikTok person is not, for example. You know? So, uh, 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 obviously, I, I thought at some point to create a blog like Filmmaking Without a Camera where filmmakers just do everything but not no images. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so that you develop a skill or a way we look at the world, you know, a way we kind of engage with the world without having any um, any uh, uh, camera. The camera comes after as something obvious afterwards. Uh, but I think the work to, ahead, and that's what I teach to a lot of students, I think, as a filmmaker, you have a kind of, you need to have a kind of point of view on the world. You need to, to think about something. You know, it doesn't matter if you agree or you don't agree, but having a kind of perspective, you know, a vision, you know, for me is, is really important. And, uh, and we shouldn't forget, like, uh, being from Africa, somehow we, we are loaded with the gaze uh, uh, we, 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 we had, you know, like uh, people had been seeing us as the poor, the underdeveloped, the, the, all the, 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 the stuff also that make us sick somehow because we start believing in these things, we start becoming all these things. So now we live in a world where you're being seen as all this. You, you are the object. You're not supposed to speak. They speak about you. So you are the object. So these are the, the reality of being from that place. Uh, uh, and I always talk about making movies from a place and not making movies for an audience, you know. But obviously, if you start thinking about audience, ah, I need to make a film so that in Berlin I'll be, you know, uh, I don't know, celebrate, whatever. Obviously, um, it, 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 it's, it's not what we're trying to do. It's to kind of tell our experience for, from where we are, meaning... Uh, uh, the, the, the place we were assigned to be, you know, because it's like, okay, you are an African, this is your place, don't move from that place, you know. So that place is very important to be able to kind of engage with the world uh, uh, f from that place. And, and uh, I like even with a camera, you, you, you pick an angle, you know, and it's one point, an angle. You can have so many angles, but you choose one. So when you start a film, it's making a choice of a point of view. And I think that's really important to to make sure um, uh, this is uh, really addressed. So, um, uh, Mujimbe talks about us being uh, an invention, you know, uh, Africa, the invention of Africa, uh, talking about the, the Berlin Conference because he happened to be uh, uh, president of uh, the African Institute in London, and the African Institute was the scientific branch of the Berlin Conference. That's where all the, the scientific documents were, uh, were, were studied, were done, were prepared before they were brought to Berlin Conference so that then Africa would be divided the way it was divided. So uh, Mudimbe made this book, so called The Invention of Africa. And in the interview we did, he actually says, yes, uh, the first thing is to acknowledge that you are an invention. You're Cameroonian. You didn't decide to be a Cameroonian. Even the name, I don't know, the German or the Portuguese came up with the name. Uh, and then uh, my grandfather didn't negotiate with uh, the one in the north to create a country. The Germans did it. Or, uh, so this idea that we're an invention, first, it's good to know that we're an invention, but reinvention should be the project. He says that you know, we can't do anything about being invented, but we can reinvent uh, ourselves. So in that sense, uh, uh, I think cinema, I don't know, African cinema or cinema from the South, however you name it, mm -hmm. third cinema, whatever, so it should kind of always reinvent itself. I mentioned the third cinema because what I like is all the attempts to, invent cine to reinvent cinema. Uh, one of the ones I like, obviously, in, uh, she passed, she's part of third cinema, Sarah Maldoror. She made this film called Sambizanga. Sarah Maldoror, she's from Martinique, and um, she was married to the president of the MPLA, the Movement of Liberation of Angola, Angola. and she made a film called Sambizanga, and this film was to give strength to fighters, it was not to go to a festival. <laughs> she was just trying to give energy for those, to those who were fighting. That's why she made the film. 
you know. And I think uh, I think uh, Solanas was part of this movement too, and many many filmmakers. But the idea of making movies for other reasons, you know. Um, and then another movement I like was uh, the Kucha Kanema. The Kucha Kanema was in Mozambique. Um, it's um, uh, 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 the, the leaders of uh, the Mozambique. Uh, uh, what is his name? The president, uh, Samora Machel. He decided that media are so important. There's no way we would really repeat other people's mistake. So we will create a cinema, which was television more, of the people, you know. And he invited Jean Luc Godard. He invited I think Jean Rouge. They came uh, to Maputo to try to train a generation of filmmakers, you know, uh, to just try something else, you know, uh, uh, as, as, as a cinema. Mm? So I, I think, um, uh, um, obviously, Nouvelle Vague in France, uh, uh, so I don't have to talk about it much, but everybody talks about it now because Godard is dead. But I think that's also one of movement. But it's interesting, all these attempts, you know, of at least trying something. For me, that's the very first step of healing cinema. So it's not about going through a formula uh, right away, but at least to get out of, you know, the prison or, or the, the, as I was just saying to someone, uh, the cinema has been hijacked, you know, uh, and turned into something else. And sometimes they use technology for, to continue the process. You know, uh, before we had independent cinema, now you have the platforms. But who can own a platform here? <laughs> so, you, you, so it's clear that you know everything is being taken from us, but we still call it cinema, and we have become the um, the follower of a system that is against us somehow, against uh, whatever is different, what is free, what is opening um, uh, a new space. So uh, we just watch one of my attempts to teach cinema differently, and then we'll finish. Mm -hmm. Somebody talks about it because was it Rihanna? No, it was Jay Z.
Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. Um, we, we're going to take a break now.